Welcome to the Westport Library. Today's program will begin momentarily. Supported by Verso Studios, created locally and shared with the world. Welcome, my name is Jennifer Bangser and I'm honored to welcome you all to a new initiative here at the Westport Library. We are gathering our long-supported educational initiatives under an umbrella of lifelong learning and education called Verso University. Verso University will provide year-run classes, workshops, and lectures running the gamut of educational opportunities designed to further education and take your learning to the next level for all ages and to meet the community interests. We are truly delighted to launch this initiative with an individual who represents the very best in lifelong learning, Westport's own Marty Ellen. He will speak on a subject tailored, made for lifelong learning, the wonders of the universe. Further courses to look forward to um, include an upcoming class that starts April 4th, The Range of Literal, Literary Realism with Dr. Mark Shanker of Yale University. Uh, in May, you can watch for a workshop on problem solving, uh, a class in fiction writing, and there'll be a special tra Verso training course called Crew Call for those of you interested in learning more about video and audio production to help the library in our programs. Um, so before we go a little further, John Brandt, Marty's friend with the Wiseman, is going to come up and do a little interview. And I welcome you all, and please look forward to learning more about Verso University as the years the months come, go by with new programs constantly. But today, let's get ready, set, and launch Verso University with the wise men, courtesy of John Brandt and Marty Yellen. I hope you all saw that. I, I get a Boy Scout attaboy for that. Uh, <laughs> While I was waiting to introduce Marty, somebody dropped a whole bunch of wise men brochures on my, on my chair. Um, I assume that I'm supposed to tell you that they're available. Um, thanks for coming this afternoon. Um, with some weather on the way, it's probably a good use of your time. And it's going to be an illuminating afternoon, I think. Uh, we're here to take a peek behind the curtain of the extraordinary technology that has opened new astronomical vistas to mankind. Um, will these instruments answer our questions or produce more? <laughs> I think probably both. Our tour guide to the cosmos today is Dr. Martin Yellen, PhD in biomedical engineering and a lifelong astronomy geek. I don't think astronomy is the only kind of geek he is. He's a geek about everything. And he's so knowledgeable. I mean, the guy is a walking encyclopedia. Uh, during his tenure at the Perkin Umber Corporation, he worked on the Hubble telescope which was the precursor of the web, um, and is eminently uh, qualified to talk about its, its successor, the James Webb Telescope, and that's the subject of today. The microphone is uh, on a different wavelength. Um, Dr. Yellen's knowledge of the cosmos and the technology that make it real and relevant to us is unique in my circle of friends. He is, quite frankly, the best possible person to lead us on this journey. As you'll see, his knowledge of the universe and beyond is only matched by his enthusiasm. People of Earth, please welcome Dr. Martin Yellen, today's tour guide to the cosmos. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I love giving this presentation, which changes every week, because I keep getting updates from the Hubble, from the James Webb. I'm kind of not a consultant, but I, the manager of the James Webb was the manager of the Hubble, so she and I know each other very well, and she explains many of these things, and they're just blowing my mind. So even though you may have heard me talk about this before, about one third of the slides are brand new, so we'll go from there. I realize my audience probably includes no scientists, or it'd be nice if it were, but, and some of the things I'm gonna talk about are difficult. I try to make it as simple as possible, but there are things I think uh, will make your brain itch. 
that they're so complicated to understand. But that's okay, because I don't understand it either, and neither do the people that discovered it. Uh, we're talking about the world of quantum physics, which is very, very tiny. Uh, there's no magnifying system in the world that could see these particles, but we see them at the L Large Hadron Collider, where we bombard two uh, protons going in opposite directions, 27 miles. When they hit, they create all these tiny little particles for about a nanosecond, that's 10 to the minus length, and uh, so we know they're there. And, uh, but we can't show you a picture of them, but we have a computer simulation of them I'm gonna show you as a video. So, let's start from the beginning. For 7,000 years, starting with the ancient Greeks and the Arab world especially, people wondered about some of these things. How old is the universe? How big? How did it get here? What was here before that? How did life start? Uh, where's it gonna end? And, and all these strange things we see, like dark matter and dark energy, that nobody knows what it is, but it has a tremendous effect on everything. And um, I added this one. So the, now that the Hubble, which was launched in 1990, 33 years up there, it's designed for 15, it, uh, it has discovered over 15,000 things we didn't know. But looking at this list, we now know how big the universe is. How it began, we're not sure. I'll show you some of the ideas. Uh, was, what was there before? I don't think we'll ever know. We don't know. Is it flat or curved? We know it's flat. Does it have an edge? We don't know because everything is expanding so fast that we can't see the edge. We can only see stuff that's 13.8 billion light years away, because that's how old it is, but it's moving much faster than the speed of light, the uh, space. Uh, so we'll never have enough time to see an edge, or much less know what's on the other side of the edge, which is kind of hard to understand, because it's space that's expanding. So what is it expanding into? Not space. Anyhow, and you can read the rest. Uh, the one I'm most interested in and the one I'm talking to uh, Heidi Hamill at, uh, on the James Webb is, is extraterrestrial life, not necessarily intelligent life, but we're getting so close now to finding planets that are like Earth. And if we could only get an image, we could measure their atmosphere, we could measure their temperature, we know they have liquid water, they know the temperature on it because we know its distance from its star, but we can't, we need to get a picture of it. But because the star is so much brighter than the planet, you have to completely block out the light from the star to be able to look at the uh, uh, planet. Hopefully James Webb with that tennis court size heat shield light shield, will be able to sneak between the star and the planet, block the star, and take a picture. And if there's lights in the picture, we know there's intelligent life. Okay, and I'll show you a picture of a black hole, and we know how the universe will end. Dark matter and dark energy, I can't talk too much about because it takes too long. Dark matter is a form of gravity, but we don't know, but there's nothing there. It's, but we know it's there because it does things. We don't know what it is. It's invisible. And dark energy is something we discovered in 1998, is something that's pulling our universe apart. And eventually it's gonna pull everything apart. And uh, so don't worry too much. So I'll start with the Hubble. I'll just give, I'll give a little tour of the telescope, but I'm gonna focus on the pretty pictures and the science. So the Hubble is the size of a school bus. It was, we won the contract for that in 1970, 72. So the technology was not that great in terms of uh, CCDs. The biggest array you could buy was four, four kilobytes, four megabytes, 2000 by 2000. 
And there were no uh, computers to speak of, except large ones. And uh, so it's got the optical system, solar panels, and it's about 250 miles above the Earth. And it was designed to be, because we knew the technology was going to get better, it was the only satellite ever made that was designed to be changed in space. So the back of the telescope, where it says cameras, there's five instruments there, each the size of a telephone booth. And six times we've gone back to that place and replaced those telephone booths with updated instruments. And uh, the latest instruments now has an array with uh, 12,000 by 12,000, uh, 144 million bits, and other things. So it's been a great success. It discovered the age of the universe three ways, 13.8 billion years. It discovered that there's a black hole in the center of every galaxy like the Milky Way that will eventually eat the Milky Way. It discovered planets that look like they could have life, 6,000 of them, just in our Milky Way. And it's, it was just, it's just been a pleasure to see it still working. It'll last maybe two more years, and then it's going to, unless there's no way, we have no shuttle to bring it back, and it'll just uh, have to burn up, unfortunately. And this is the mirror. The primary mirror, the size was set by the shuttle bay that it fit in. We would have liked it to have been bigger. The bigger the mirror, the, the more sensitive it is, the further away you could see, etc. But this mirror alone took five years to make. It, it had to be so smooth that if this mirror was the size of the United States, 3,000 miles, the biggest bump would be a half an inch. It's tremendously smooth, and it had to be done not by humans, but by machines that we had to develop that automatically had these little fingers that moved all around the mirror and to a software, kept grinding it for years, polishing it for years, and it was really amazing. So you don't have to read this, but it was very, it's been very successful. Now here's the new James Webb, on the ground with the people that worked on it. It's an amazing telescope. Unlike the Hubble, which is visible, this is infrared. And you're going to still see why the advantage of infrared. I have to explain the Doppler effect. I'll do that in the next slide or two. But all the furthest, the earliest stars that were made have now expanded the most. And as they expand, they get red. They, they could have started off as a blue, then they get to red, infrared, microwave, radio. So you can't see it with a visible telescope. This can. And that means it can go back almost to the beginning of visible universe, about two, two, me, 200 million years from the Big Bang, whereas the Hubble can only go back 3 billion years from the Big Bang. Also, this can see through clouds, because infrared, that's what firemen use in their flashlights. Uh, infrared can see through smoke, because it's not scattered like part from the particles. So we could see through clouds. And that's very important in watching stars being born, which I'll show you. This is just a comparison of the two mirrors. The bottom line is that the Webb is 100 times more sensitive than the uh, Hubble. And that means it can either look 100 times further away, or it can look at something 100 times dimmer, which is usually ones that are further away. Uh, you don't have to look at that. The, the Webb science goals is four things, but I'm really interested in the, in the, in the last one. Um, but it's going to try to get us back to the beginning as possible. If the universe is 13.8 billion years old, this, this has already gone back 13.5 billion years. So we're really seeing the first stars being, well, the goal is to see the first stars being born, how they're being born, and how they eventually evolve into galaxies. And the, the bottom one is, 
the web has the ability to look at the atmosphere of some of these planets that we don't know have life and tell what chemicals are in the atmosphere using something called a spectrometer, very important. You could look at anything with a spectrometer and tell you what it's made of by the colors you see. It's almost like a barcode for each element. And they have now found planets with water that have oxygen, methane, and water vapor in their atmosphere. And the only way you can get that combination that we know of is if there's at least plant life. The closest one is 27 light years away. You gotta understand a telescope is also a time machine. So when we look at something, let's say a thousand light years away, we're looking at the light that left a thousand years ago. So we're seeing, we're looking at stars that may not even exist anymore because there's, they died. I mean, some of the stars could be billions of years old and it would take billions of years for the light to get to us. Uh, an interesting thing is, if you were on a star 100 years, 100 light years from us, and you were trying to see if there was life on Earth, and you listened, you'd hear nothing. Radio was invented in 1924, okay? So there was no signals in 1920, which is what they would be seeing. So, I Love Lucy now has crossed, which came out in 55, has now crossed uh, 73 light years. And uh, if anybody's interested in watching it out there, they could see it. But it is a time machine. In fact, many of these stars, the light that we see, when the light left the stars, we didn't even exist yet. We're four and a half billion years old. Okay. Now, good question I get asked a lot, especially by politicians is why spend billions of dollars to put these telescopes up? I mean, the, uh, the Hubble was about six billion. The Webb is over 10 billion. Uh, and there were much larger telescopes on the ground, much easier to get the data. They were all over the planet, mostly in uh, high mountain areas, like Kid Peak in Arizona, Mauna Loa in uh, Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea in Hawaii, uh, in Chile in Southern Europe and the Alps. But there's four reasons, basically. One, non-technical, and that's the first one. Um, the problem with ground telescopes is if it, the day you get to use one, if it's raining or cloudy, you can't use it. There were PhD students waiting a year to get to one of these telescopes because in science, you can't just have a good idea. You've got to test it. It's got to be shown to be real. And if it's a bad day, they go to the back of the line and they may use it, lose another year. Whereas when you're up there, it's working 24 seven. And if you go down to where the data is coming down in Greenpoint, Maryland, there's about 75 astronomers all working on their doctorate, each sitting at doing their science and simultaneously, it's so productive. The other thing is the atmosphere between us and the stars is full of layers of different temperature, which causes distortion. So you, no matter how big you made the mirror on the ground, you couldn't see better than maybe a 40 inch mirror because the atmosphere which makes stars twinkle just destroys it whereas you could see the equivalent of a 40, 400 inch mirror up above the atmosphere. That's why we put observatories on top of mountains, at least 10,000 feet, so we don't get the background noise, the light, and we have as little atmosphere above us as possible. The third very important reason is, and I have to show you this and you may get a little confused, light is, a wave that runs in vacuum, and it goes from extremely high frequency called cosmic rays through gamma rays, through ultraviolet, to visible, which we could see, to infrared, which we can feel, to microwaves, which causes things to vibrate, to radio waves, which go through us without damage. And unfortunately, our atmosphere blocks a lot of those wavelengths 
Actually, fortunately, we don't want x-rays to come through the atmosphere. I mean, it's one of the reasons we're alive is that we have an atmosphere that blocks these dangerous high frequency light waves. But we have now x-ray telescopes, infrared telescopes, visible telescopes, cosmic ray telescopes, gamma ray telescopes, microwave telescopes, all working together. And the information that comes down is the synthesis of all of those. And the most important thing is we can see over 100 times further back in time from the ground to being in space, especially the web, which is a million year, uh, miles above the Earth. OK, uh, I have to explain this. It's not that hard. But light wave is, is not like a sound wave. A sound wave is a vibration of the particles in the air or in the water or in a, or in a solid thing. And if you have a vacuum, you can't hear the sound. The classic example is you put an alarm clock inside a bell jar, you evacuate the air, and you can't hear the alarm anymore. Light waves could drive it, go through anything. Uh, it's a very different kind of wave. And depending upon the frequency, it's a very different type of wave. <laughs> I said it twice. So let's look at this. The narrow part in the middle of the colors, visible light, is all we're designed to see. And maybe it's a good thing. Because nature doesn't need for us to see x-rays or microwaves or radio. I mean, you just think about evolution. However, there's a lot of information in those wavelengths. So let's start at the left. This is the high frequency stuff, which is very dangerous. Cosmic rays, if the atmosphere, the atmosphere would allow them to go through, but we have something called a magnetic field, the North Pole, the South Pole. That magnetic field deflects cosmic rays so they don't hit the Earth. The magnetic field disappears once in a while, every few thousand years, maybe. And if it does, then we could have a real problem because those cosmic waves would destroy our entire electrical infrastructure. Gamma rays don't go through the atmosphere. X-rays, thankfully, don't go through the atmosphere. Ultraviolet, as you probably know, there's UVA, UVB, and UVC. A UVA is pretty harmless. UVB is what gives you suntan and skin cancer. And UVC, which doesn't come through, would kill you. It would just, just break up your chromosomes and genes. The energy is so high, it would go right through your skin and damage you, kill you. On the other side now, visible, we have where the web is, infrared. Infrared is, uh, we don't see infrared, but we feel it. It's called heat. And, uh, and I'm going to show you why in a few minutes, why it's so important. And then if you go even longer, you have microwaves, like your microwave oven, which is really now a frequency which makes the water vibrate inside anything you put in the microwave, or any liquid, uh, including blood, so you don't want to be exposed to them. And then there's radar, which is lower frequency. And then you have the broadcast band, the radio, cell phones, TV. They're all harmless. They all go through us all day, night now. And uh, we're not they really don't have any information for us. Now, the key thing about this is called the Doppler effect. I don't know if you all know what that means, but let me explain. If a car goes by, like a police car with a siren, as it comes closer to you, the frequency goes up. And then when it leaves, the frequency goes down. It goes, Think of the uh, sound as a spring. So when the car is coming towards you, the spring is compressing and the frequency is higher. When the car is going away from you, it's pulling on the string, the frequency is lower. That's called the Doppler effect. Now, it turns out it only doesn't work for sound, it works for light also. So as things move away, light, they get redder and redder and infrared and invisible to us. The, the web can now see those things, as I said, 10 minutes ago, the web can go back to the very beginning that has traveled the most and it kept shifting from blue to red, infrared, 
Whereas the Hubble only looks at visible light, the web can see the earliest things in the universe. It could almost go back. We can't go back to the Big Bang because there's a, as I'll show you, there's a, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang where the universe is opaque. It's a plasma. Anyhow, so the Doppler effect is important, and I like this little note. <laughs> Anyhow, I find that funny. <laughs> okay, this is an interesting chart showing how far we can see from the top is the uh, ground, and we can see about six billion years from the beginning. Um, the Hubble, the, uh, the 2010 one never happened. The 2004 Hubble could see 800 million years from the beginning, and the James Webb can see less than 200 million years from the beginning. So we could see back over 13.5 billion years of the 13.7 that exists. So it's a, very, it's a very powerful tool. Hope you're still with me. Soon we'll get the pretty pictures. Okay. So now if you want to know the history of, of everything, right now we see we're 14 billion years from the beginning, 13.8, 14. The beginning was the Big Bang, which I'll explain. And then if, if, if you go back in time, the stars formed about 100 million years after the Big Bang. And Webb could almost get there. Right now, they're at 200 million years. Now, in order to have stars, you don't know yet how stars are made. You got to have hydrogen atoms. Stars are made by nuclear fusion, the same thing that goes in a hydrogen bomb. You squeeze two hydrogens together because of the pressure of this massive gravity due to this big billion, billion ton object squeezing on it, and it turns to helium. And when it does, it gives off megatons of energy. I'll show that later. But uh, so the stars are made from atoms. We could see that. The atoms have a nuclei. We can't see that. It's so small. But we could make them at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider. And then the nucleus contains protons and neutrons. That's called nucleons. Again, we can't see it. And then what made those things? We know what it is analytically, and we've seen them at at the Large Hadron Collider, but there's no way of, uh, there's no way we could visually see it. And so what we say when people ask us is that we have a pretty good knowledge after 10 to the minus 13 seconds. Brave but informed guesses, extremely brave but not nuts. We try our best analytically to figure out how the whole universe could have fit into something so small, it was like 1,000th the size of, an at, of a proton. Uh, and, uh, and over 100 billion degrees in temperature. Unfortunately, at that temperature, all our laws of physics break down, and we can't analytically calculate what it takes, how it happened, but I'm going to show you our best ideas. OK. So I'm going to start at the Big Bang. What is it? 13.8 billion years ago, something happened which caused something. We think it was almost a, a singularity. It could have been a previous universe that had collapsed to a point. And it was so hot, it expanded, and it's still expanding. The expansion in the beginning was so amazing. In less than a millionth of a second, it went from the size of a golf ball to the size of the Earth. In less than a millionth of a second. It was not an explosion. It's not like a firecracker somewhere. It's just a big expansion of space. And that's the point. So it leads to the question. Uh, what was before and what caused this had to happen? Now, we don't know what happened before, 
But Einstein says, we know. Look at my equations. If you put time equal less than zero, there's no time and there's no space. So he said, there was no time or space before this happened. Time and space was created by the Big Bang, which is hard for our brains to think about because it's, what is it expanding into if it's making space and time? It gets complicated. So now I have to show, do, do a little experiment with you and explain something that's gonna be very hard to understand. This is a bottle, empty. It's got a vacuum on it. There's nothing in it. It weighs exactly what an empty glass should be. Now, if Einstein was in the audience, he'd say, you haven't taken everything out yet. And I'd say, what do you mean? He said, you didn't take the space out, the empty space. I said, well, how could that, what do you mean I didn't take out the empty space? It's empty space. He said, there's no such thing as empty space. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, space expands, right? Yes. And since it moves, it's got energy, yes. Energy equal mass times speed of light squared, E equal mc squared. That's the only equation you need to know. So therefore, it has mass in it. Maybe very small, but it's there. And we've never seen it, but somebody followed up with what Einstein said just four years ago and solved all his equations and made a computer simulation of what that would look like. And um, I'm going to just wake up. OK, and it kind of, this is blown up 10 billion times in time and slowed down 100 million times. I mean, 10 billion times in space and blown, slowed down 100 million times in, in time. What you see here are these particles that Einstein predicts in his equations. They're called virtual particles. And the thing about them is that for every particle that's made, an antiparticle is made. It's the opposite polarity. And when they meet, they cancel out. So effectively, you have nothing. But in, the, but in between, you have all these things going on. Any, any, all space has, is, has that in it right now. Everything, all space. And what happens, and we still don't know why, is that for every million times this happens, there's one extra particle left over, which is matter, not antimatter. And over time, this builds up, and this will eventually become electrons and quarks, which are the basis of atoms, protons, and neutrons. And, and, and we don't understand it. It's quantum physics. The math shows it, I think. Yeah, so, but I love this. Uh, the guy spent about 10 years writing this program. It took nine years to understand the equations and one year to write the program. <laughs> um, let's get back to big. Okay. So let me, let, me, let me give you an idea of the scale. The top is a virus. It's the smallest thing we could probably see. And it's, by the way, in engineering, instead of writing point zero, 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 0.000001, we just say 10 to the minus seventh. That is, there's seven places between the one and the, and the thing. It makes life a lot easier than to write out these big equations. And so the virus is made up of molecules, proteins. And that's about one hundredth the size of a virus. So now we're down to 10 to the minus nine meters. And now the proteins are made up of elements which have atoms. I mean, there's a hydrogen element, it could be a helium element, etc. And they're 10% smaller. And then the atom has a nucleus where the protons and neutrons are. And they're made from something that you've probably never heard of called quarks. And we believe that is the smallest possible thing that could ever ever has and ever will exist. The name quark, and there's six of them, up, down, strange, charm, top, bottom. Each does something different, but combinations of like three quarks, two ups and one down, make a proton. Two down and one up make a neutron. 
the quarks are held together inside the proton by something called gluons, which essentially glues the quarks together because they want to repel. It's like putting rubber bands around it. And then below quarks, I wrote, here there be dragons, like they used to have on maps when people sailed further than where they knew. So those things you saw in that video were quarks. Quarks. And by the way, the name quark comes from a book called Finnegan's Wake. I don't know if anybody ever read it by James Joyce. It's the book where the last page continues on the first page. It's a very interesting book to read. But in it, there's a scene in a pub in Wales where somebody yells out, three quarks for Mr. Mark. And the guy who won the Nobel Prize uh, for developing this uh, used that name because he didn't know what other name. He thought that was strange enough because we don't know what it is. But there's nothing inside of a quark. We find that out by putting x-rays and there's no, nothing bounces back. It all goes right through no matter what part of the quark you illuminate. So that's the beginning of us. <laughs> and it's hard to comprehend. Of course, that equation was a little complicated. <laughs> because, you know, you're dealing with, uh, <laughs> you're dealing with very complicated mathematics that I don't understand. Now, this could all be wrong, by the way. <laughs> could all be wrong, but it seems to work. And it seems to work in that from this, we could develop semiconductors, cell phones, computers, radios, televisions. Everything we use is made from quantum physics using the knowledge of quarks and protons and neutrons and electrons. So it works, but we don't understand it. Our brain is not designed to understand it. It's amazing that we live like in nowhere in the universe, and we know so much about it that we're not supposed to know. Okay, let's get back to uh, some uh, pretty pictures and things. So one light year, light goes at 186,000 miles per second. So in a year, it would travel six trillion miles. The nearest star to Earth is 4.3 light years away. So that's about 25 billion miles. The fastest rocket ship we have can go 30,000 miles an hour. To just get to the nearest star would take 800,000 years. So the idea of aliens the idea would take 800,000 years because the distance, we can't, we've never gone faster than 30,000 miles an hour. I mean, other things have, like meteors coming into Earth, et cetera. But even if it was 100,000 miles an hour, to go 6 billion miles times 4, you know, it's like 150 lifetimes. And that's the nearest star. The furthest star is 10 billion times further. So the idea of aliens coming here, landing in a cornfield, usually, uh, taking a farmer's wife into a spacecraft, dissecting her and making love to her and putting her back and then leaving. It just is so stupid. I mean, I don't understand it. <laughs> and people believe this. And if you were going to travel all that distance, why would you want to just go to a cornfield? I mean, <laughs> but uh, very interesting. Humans are strange. OK, so the speed of light is fixed. Nothing can go faster. As you try to, according to Einstein, and this has been tested, as you go faster, you get heavier and heavier. Time slows down. So yes, it's true that if you had two twins and one went up at space at a very high speed for 10 years, when he would come back, he'd be much younger than his twin brother because his time slowed down as he went faster and faster. Now, According to Einstein, as you get near the speed of light, you get heavier and heavier, everything is slows down, and eventually your weight would be infinity. And so nothing goes faster except space goes faster. Einstein said you can't go through space faster than the speed of light, but space has nothing relative to. It's space. It can go as fast as it wants, and it does. We're now measuring stars receding in a distance 
to by four times the speed of light, and it's going up. That's why everything's going to move away, and someday we'll look up at the sky and see just, just the Milky Way instead of the billions of Milky Ways out there. And you can see, everybody knows this, if the sun disappeared, it would take eight minutes before you knew it, because it takes eight minutes for the light from the sun. You're looking at the sun eight minutes ago. Mars, 12.7 minutes. That nearest star, 4.3 years. And if you want to look on the other side of the Milky Way, this is just the Milky Way, where we are in the little corner, it would take 52,000 light years. Wow. So it would take 52,000 years for a signal to get from here, to get from one side to the other. So how many stars are there? One of the jobs that Hubble did was it mapped the entire sky. And this is obsolete now, because in the inf they missed a lot that was in the infrared that the Hubble couldn't see. So 100 billion stars per galaxy is like the Milky Way has 100 billion stars. The sun is one of them. At, when Hubble did this work, he said there's 100 billion galaxies. Right now, with Webb, they found out there's 2 trillion galaxies. So, but just using these numbers, there are more stars than grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. And with the new number, there's more stars than grains of sand, including under all the oceans. I mean, so why would one star, why is this night different than any other night? Why would one star, one planet out of zillions be different, be the only one with life? I don't know but I doubt it. And from what we're learning now with the web, we're seeing that there must be millions of stars like Earth, suns like Earth, stars that have planets like Earth, millions, which is just, just three zeros, three zeros. And there's still another thousand million, billion, trillion, quadrillion stars that wouldn't have life. I mean, it's still, a small number. Now, one of the things we did on the Hubble, this is how we did it. We looked at the size of a dime, just looked up at a part of the sky that was absolutely black, nothing there. And we spent two weeks, which is a very hard thing to do. I was involved with the pointing system. I'm not an optical engineer. And it had to be absolutely still to point zero, 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 0007 arc seconds. It's just very tiny. It's like one thousandth of a hair for two weeks. And you have solar winds, and you have gravity effects, and you have other things. It's very complicated. But after two weeks, this is what we saw in this little dime-shaped thing. Those are not stars. Those are all galaxies, like the Milky Way, every one of them. Some are bigger, some are further, some are closer. Some of you could see are turning reddish because the, that red shift I talked about, the Doppler effect, is causing them to move so far away and so, that the, uh, and so fast that the light has shifted. And eventually, all these would disappear. But Hubble did this over the entire sphere of the visible universe and found it was the same everywhere. The whole universe is filled up like this. Absolutely amazing. And that's how they figured out how many, how Hubble figured out how many actually counted every one of these things. And, uh, and, and uh, whatever. I can't get into this, but everything you see in the universe is only 5% of the universe. The rest is dark matter, which is this secret. Dark matter, we don't know what it is, but let me tell you how we found it. Actually, Vera Rubin, a very famous astronomer, found it and should have got the Nobel Prize, but because she was a woman and Jewish, they wouldn't give her the Nobel Prize, which is a shame. Her boss has got it. So dark matter, take the Milky Way. It's rotating at 67,000 miles an hour. If you added up the gravity of everything you could see, it would not be enough for it not to fly apart. It's a centrifugal force. 
So it turns out there's five times as much matter in there, the gravity that holds it together. We don't know what it is. It's, there's, there's, it gives off no light. It absorbs no light, but it's there. So that's, that's one. And then in 1998, they did an experiment to see how much the Earth, the, the, the uh, universe is slowing down. You would figure if you had this massive acceleration, eventually things would slow down, just like if you shot something up, like fireworks, you know, eventually it would come down. Instead, they found it speeding up, and that's dark energy. And that's the, that was a massive error, surprise. The universe is going faster and faster as if something is attracting it, like another universe or whatever. And that represents 72% of all the energy in the universe. And we can, so all these stars that are more than the number of sand and all the beaches is only 4.6% of the universe. It's, it's just our brains have a hard time with it. So there's a photo of a black hole. <laughs> Here's a real photo taken by James Webb. Every, this is the nearest galaxy to us, Andromeda, which looks like the Milky Way. Obviously, we can't take a picture looking down on the Milky Way because we're in the Milky Way. We're kind of in like in the left lower part. And in the center is this massive black hole and it seems to be in the center of every universe. And it's doing its thing, eating stars that cross the horizon, the event horizon. And uh, what a black hole is, is that there was a star that was so big, like a thousand times bigger than the sun, that when it ran out of fuel, it collapsed. And the gravity, the mass stayed the same, but the size of it dropped maybe a hundred thousandth. It was like taking the sun and making it the size of a ping pong ball with the same weight. So the gravity was so strong that not even light can escape. So anything that falls in there never comes back again. Now on the other side of a black hole is a white hole. This is something new that we're, that we're working on. We think the white hole may be the way universes start, that the white hole gives birth to a universe. But there's no way of knowing because we can't put anything in there to look because it never will come out, not even the light. So, but we're working on it. They're working on it. I'm not working on it. I'm resting. Okay, let's talk about our little Milky Way, uh, Milky Way, solar system. We have a sun, and I, I keep Pluto in even though my kids would kill me if I took Pluto out. So, uh, <laughs> Now, the interesting thing is that we don't have to maybe go distance to find life. Jupiter has two moons, Eo, well, it has 27 moons, but two of them, Eo and Europa, are covered with ice, but we see seawater, salt water, shooting out through the ice, geysers, all over. Yet, it's too cold to have liquid water, but what's happened is Jupiter is so big that the, as, the, as the moon goes around, the tugging of the gravity, it's an elliptical orbit, goes from strong to weak to strong to weak and breaks up the ice into water, heats it up. So in two years, we're sending a mission to Jupiter. The ice is about a mile thick. Go down and look at the ocean. There's more ocean on Jupiter than there is on Earth, inside Jupiter. And if we could find little Jovian gefilte fish or something, uh, <laughs> it would be amazing. <laughs> but so that's in three years. That would be amazing. Let's talk about the sun. It's, now, the sun is a medium sized star. If it was a very bright star, it wouldn't last as long. Some stars only last 100,000 years because they burn up so fast. Our star will last about another four and a half billion years, about nine billion years altogether. Now, how is a star made? I, I alluded to this before. The Big Bang with those quarks and those electrons made atoms, and it was all hydrogen. And hydrogen comes in three flavors, 
regular hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium, but most of it was tritium and deuterium, which just meant it had either one neutron or one, the positive is a proton. But that's not important. The point is that the gravitational squeezing of the sun pushed these together, fused them, and out came something with two protons, which is called helium, the next the next element in the periodic table, and energy. Because the mass of this is a little less than the sum of the masses of that. That change in mass times the speed of light squared is the energy. Oh, too fast. So here's the sun, it's 4.5 billion years old, it weighs 44 times 10 to the 30th pounds. How do we weigh the sun? Very easy. We know its brightness, we know its diameter, and from that you can calculate the mass. Diameter is, uh, you could fit 100 Earths in the sun, and the sun is a relatively small star. In the center, it's 10 million degrees. That's where this fusion is going on. And it takes years for the hydrogen to helium to work its way out as light to the surface temperature. And I love this. Every second, the sun produces the energy of a trillion megaton bombs, enough energy to supply the Earth for 500,000 years. And when the sun runs out of fuel, it will not explode. It will collapse, and then the outer layers will expand outward past Earth up to Mars. So, but that's four and a half billion years from now. We don't have to worry about that. We have to worry about the next eight years. So, no. <laughs> What? Microphone, I'm sorry. I was supposed to have a lavalier, but so. This is the only equation Einstein developed. It is the most important equation in the world. Energy equal mass times the speed of light squared. That's a constant, 186,000 squared. So mass and energy, all mass is, is stored energy. So anywhere you have energy, you have mass. That's why empty space, which has energy, because it expands, it moves, it's got to have something, it's got to have energy, has mass. It's a very small mass. If I write this the other way, mass equal the speed of light, energy over the speed of light squared. I mean, speed of light squared, bring this here, c squared over e, the mass would be very small. The hydrogen bomb that Russia launched about 1964 was the biggest bomb ever. I think it was 200 megatons. And that used seven pounds of hydrogen. Seven pounds, M, produced 200 million tons of TNT. Scary, scary. What? I'm out of time? Oh, well, I have to have a lot, I have, hmm. I'm gonna stay afterwards so you can ask me any questions, but let me, let me just go with you. This is a star nursery. This is taken by the Hubble. Uh, this is clouds of dust and hydrogen. And as it collects more and more dust, it gets tighter and heavier and tighter and heavier. And all of a sudden you see a baby star come out. And this is happening all the time. To get a scale of it, the distance from the top of this cloud to the bottom is about six billion miles, whatever that means. This is the same picture taken with the web, and now we can see through the clouds because it's infrared, and it finds about twice as many stars. And this is another famous web picture. This is not a mountain in, in Montana under the stars. This is cloud of dust and hydrogen creating stars, and when you create a star, it gives off ultraviolet light. By the way, all these pictures come back in black and white, but they know the wavelengths that they're measuring, and then they color them to simulate that. So, supply, it's there. This is another, this is a star that uh, is running out of fuel and it's beginning to explode called a nova, supernova. 
This is three galaxies all racing to each other, and eventually they're all going to collide. We're going to collide with uh, uh, Andromeda, but not for another million years or so. I'll have to go fast. I love this picture. This came from the web. It looks like you're looking at a tree trunk with the rings. And it took a while to figure out what the hell is going on. And then some bright guy said, oh, I know what's going on. There's another star that comes and visits this star every million years. And when it does, the gravitational pull removes some of that star layer. And then it leaves. So we could count like rings, 17 of these, that means it took 17 million years for this to be made. Just amazing. I have to talk about, give me five more minutes. This is another galaxy called the Sombrero Galaxy for obvious reasons. This star, the bright star in the upper left, is brighter than all the 100 trillion stars combined. It's called a supernova. That is so important. Because when that explodes, there's so much energy that, and this is what it looks like with uh, James Webb, it, it, when it explodes, all that material gets shot out in the universe, but because it's so powerful, the hydrogen, as it gets heavier and heavier and gravity gets stronger and stronger, turns to helium, the helium turns to carbon, the carbon turns to oxygen, Pretty soon, everything that we're made of is made in a star, and it explodes. And it's happening every second, everywhere. And that means we're made out of stardust. We are literally stardust. And because uh, all these elements, we, the universe would just be hydrogen and helium if we didn't have exploding stars. So those are our parents. Those are our ancestors. And that's the only concept you really need to know. You know the periodic elements? Well, hydrogen is on the upper left and helium is on the upper right. But everything in this right-hand side, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, iron, and all the things we're made of is made by exploding stars, big stars. And that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. So if there were no stars, there'd be no uh, anything. There'd just be gas. Well, whatever works. And by the way, I mentioned before, how do you know what something is? Every single element, it's a sodium, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen, has a barcode where it absorbs some of the light from the star behind it. So you see these black marks tells you that this is sodium. It's, it's just amazing. Use a spectrometer, you could tell exactly what anything is made of as long as it's burned. In fact, it's used locally to do uh, forensic, uh, to get evidence uh, for crimes. So nitrogen makes our DNA, calcium makes our teeth and bones, iron makes our blood, carbon makes everything else, all star stuff. <laughs> I like this, I'm almost done, two more minutes. And just to shows we found possibly 6,000 so far, and this is a shot from the uh, James Webb. And this one called C is liquid water, has oxygen and methane and carbon dioxide in its atmosphere and water vapor. And if they could only get a picture of that, these are very close to their star, but it's a very small star, so it still has liquid water. Temperature is not that hot. If they could just get between those B and C, facing C, with the sun shield blocking a portion of the star, they'd be able to photograph it. And that's up for the next year to do that, to photograph it. And that would tell us if there really is life out there. It's amazing. So I'm finished almost. And this I like, the best proof there's intelligent life is the fact that it hasn't come here. <laughs> <laughs> so how would we communicate if we found life? You can't go there, but Light travels the speed of light. Uh, let's say that, you, that civilization is a thousand years ahead of us, and they had Google, and they were broadcasting Google continuously for hundreds and hundreds of years. We would just tap into that and read there, learn about their Google a thousand years more advanced than us. It's possible. 
Now, <laughs> I had to put Yogi Berra in my talk. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about disappearing. The, the, the whole universe will disappear in a long time. The first thing is the sun will go. So you still got to vote. <laughs> so don't get depressed. <laughs> Uh, I, I won't go into that. And if you're curious, there's some references here that uh, describe this much better than I ever could. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Marty, will you stick around to answer some questions off the stage? We don't, we've run out of time because there's so much content to cover. Um, but we hope you all enjoyed our inaugural Verso University class with Marty Ellen. You're our, our, now our official class, first class. So we hope you come back for more and stick around to chat with Marty offline a little bit. Thank you.